Yeah, today we actually have a number of good questions. So I think I just want to get uh, right into it. And um, as usual, guys, I want to focus on the questions that were actually submitted from our patrons. But if you have like follow up questions or something doesn't make sense about the position, feel free to ask those in the chat as long as they have to do with the opening that we're actually talking about. Um, I simply just won't have time to answer everyone's opening question like, oh, what do you think about the bird opening? Or what do you think about the alligator opening? I don't know. It's all playable, guys. It's all it's all playable. OK, <laughs> but um, let's get to our first question here from John Jernigan, a uh, longtime supporter. And John asks, um, why is the Keras attack so strong against the Shevenigan, but not as popular slash effective against other Sicilian variations like the Taimanov? Yeah, very natural question. And um, let's let's put it on the board uh, so we can discuss the Sicilian here a bit. Okay, got our analysis board. So of course the Shevenigan uh, basically refers to generally refers to the pawn structure e6 d6, um, and uh, the Shevenigan opening I guess we could say is this one exactly when black doesn't play a6 or any moves just knight f6 and then e6 d6 so it's like an opening variation this is the the shevenigan but also it, it has to do with the the structure it's like for example if black starts with a6 we have a knight orf white makes some random move and then e6 we can call this a shevenigan structure um okay but the question is about the keras attack which is essentially uh g4 in this position um, named after the great Paul Karras, and this one has since become uh, extremely popular for white. And basically the reason why this move order for black is no longer being played um, as much as it used to be. Nowadays, most players that kind of want to play this kind of position are going to play a knight or move order for very obvious reason. The bishop simply defends against the g4 push here, so white can't play g4. White has to do something else. And it, you know, other moves have drawbacks. Um, one popular idea nowadays to play h3, trying to go g4 anyway. And this one I think is really interesting. But of course, it's not as good as the actual Keras attack because uh, later Y will spend uh, a tempo, a second tempo to go h4 in these positions once the pawns start uh, moving. But that shows you kind of the power of the attack that White is willing to often uh, get into the same thing, even kind of down a tempo. Let's quickly just say, like, why is this one so dangerous? Well, the main thing is that the pawn is running to g5, and white is going to be gaining a lot of space on the king side. And inevitably, when both kings um, castle on opposite sides of the board, this black usually is castling king side, and white is going queen side. White's g pawn is already going to be very, very far advanced. The h and f pawns can support as well. And in general, the king side attack is very, very strong for white. Black can play h6 and kind of stop g5 temporarily. But um, yeah, temporarily being the, the key word there is eventually or even immediately white is just going to go h4 and uh, prepare g5 anyway. And when you play h6 in this kind of position and you end up castling king side, oftentimes your king ends up in even more danger than it was if you left your pawn on h7 because this h6 pawn, what it does is that it gives white a target and gives white a pawn break to then open the g file in the future. So a lot of times white's attack ends up even stronger. So this move comes with drawbacks in the Sicilian. So that's the Keras attack. And um, as John says, it is considered very, very dangerous. And a lot of players uh, don't like playing against it. And then the question is, why doesn't it work against um, other lines uh, like the Taimanov and, and that kind of thing? So yeah, actually, the main reason is that we need this knight on um, f6. So for example, black can also play uh, this move order d6, e6, without developing any of the knights. Let's say white goes knight c3, and then black plays knight c6 here, um, or even a6. Here, the knight hasn't committed to f6. So already here, white could go g4. The move doesn't hang anything. But this one isn't considered as good, mainly because black can actually develop the knight to g6 and then doesn't get hit with this tempo. So it's just not as dangerous for, for, for black um, when g5 isn't coming to attack uh, the knight. So I think black sometimes plays a6 here, followed by knight e7, making sure that knight b5 is not a problem, um, and then gets to use the knight on the, the dark squares here a little bit with g6, hitting e5 and f4 and h4, and 
and all this stuff. And and white has to be careful about pushing f4 too early, right? Because there's always going to be uh, queen h4 check ideas. So this is one reason why you don't really see g4 um, if black's knight is not on f6. Um, as far as the Taimanov goes uh, in particular, let's put that one on the board. The interesting thing is that actually um, Magnus did try g4 in this position <laughs> against, I think it was Kazim Zanov in a rapid game. And he won the game. And it's actually, I mean, it's it's a move. It can be played. It's not as good again because I think it um, doesn't come with that tempo. And uh, black can still like develop the knight to e7, for example, and even one day trade these knights and bring the other knight to c6. So the pawn doesn't come with as much force, but it is an idea. But OK, not as strong. <laughs> Um, okay. So hopefully that answers uh, the question. It's mainly it has to do with this knight on f6. In fact, this idea is so um, well liked that against a knight orf, there's a couple of moves that are basically designed to play for this g4 idea. So like I mentioned, people switched over to the knight orf because um, the bishop stops the Karis attack for uh, at least one more move. Now white can either spend a tempo to go h3 here, rook g1 is a move with idea to play um, g4. And there are even some very like devious moves here. For instance, I'm, I'm a big fan of this move, knight b3. It looks like such an innocuous move, but the point is, is that it's kind of a useful waiting move, regardless of how black continues. But based on what black does with uh, their pawns, white can kind of uh, choose their plan from there. So if black plays e6, then the bishop is blocked, and lo and behold, white can now play g4, and you get the Karis attack where knight b3 is actually kind of a useful move for white in these positions. Not the best move, but it's very worth it for white to do this because now they get to play g4, g5 um, for free. Hey, Graham, what's up, man? Wow, 16 months up. That's, yeah, that's a founder batch. Nice. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so black doesn't have to play e6, that's just one of the ideas, but if black plays e5, for example, then the point is to go bishop g5 and try to use this d5 square. And here knight b3 was again useful because uh, this move didn't come with tempo and white was able to immediately put this bishop on its best square, kind of challenging the knight on f6 and uh, fighting for the d5 square, kind of Sveshnikov style. But compared to the Sveshnikov, this knight is on b3 instead of a3, which is better because I think it can reroute to the center much, much quickly, much more quickly, much easier. It's it's better place, guys. OK, <laughs> so hopefully that answers the question. Um, John, let me move on to the next question here, which I think is still visible. Yeah. What is the best variation in Dojo's view for black? This comes from Ian, by the way. Shout out to Ian. Um, what is the best variation for Dojo's view in Dojo's view for black versus the bishop f4 variation in the queen's gambit declined. OK, let's um, put that on the board. So we're asking about the QGD. And a lot of times the bishop f4 comes out of this move order, where black threatens a nimzo, white plays knight f3, d5, knight c3, bishop e7, now black uh, white goes bishop f4. Um, OK, so yeah, there's different uh, lines here that black can choose. Generally, black starts with castles because that's just a useful move regardless. And white will typically play e3 in this position. There are other moves like white can try to be a little cheeky and start with a3. I wouldn't quite worry about like the, the nuances for now. I would, let's just say e3. And here there's a couple different directions that the game can go. Um, one move that is played a lot that I would not recommend in this position is dc4. A lot of people don't really respect the tempo. If you're going to take on c4, definitely wait for white to develop the bishop and then take because you basically get, you know, you're just giving your opponent a free move when you take on c4 in this position. So if you want to prep taking on c4, one clever little move is a6. Uh, I think this is going to be a useful move for black in almost um, any variation. And then the idea is that when white moves the bishop, we're ready to take on c4 and we're already ready to hit the bishop with b5 and our bishop comes to b7. And so black is on their way to kind of solving their opening problems. The classic plan in these positions is always to put the knight on d7, prepare the pawn break c5, 
and get all the pieces out. Rooks come to c8 and d8, queen can come to b6 here, for example, and generally black has a pretty comfortable life, something like this. Um, so this is one option. One move that I don't like, that I'm sure is completely fine, I just think people play it for the wrong reasons, <laughs> is this move c6 here. It's a very solid move, but this move is only necessary when white is going for like the exchange structure. So let me just explain that real quick. Let's say we castle here and then white took, and we got this exchange structure like this. And then c6, this is like the Carlsbad move. Very, very useful. You defend the d5 square. Your bishop is going to try to come out on this diagonal. And generally, black is, of course, very solid. If white does not take on d5, though, like if they play e3 and they keep the tension, then c6 might not be the most useful move for you because you might want the bishop on this diagonal and then the, the c pawn is just going to block it, right? When you play c6, it's not clear what's going to happen to the bishop. So this move to me just doesn't feel very flexible. And now for sure, white is never going to take on d5 and let you open up your bishop. So <laughs> you can forget about that. And now you have to figure it out. So there are like, let's say some semi-slav ideas, like you can take on c4 and go b5 similar to this, like bishop to b7. But I don't quite see the point of this one because you can more or less get the same thing without ever having touched your c-pawn, like with a6. So if this is the idea, then I think starting with a6 uh, makes a lot more sense. Okay, um, other options here. Knight d7 has long been a very, very popular move. I'm not sure if I would recommend it for most of the people watching because when white plays like c5 in these positions, um, I mean, the, the top guys, they hold this one, but I feel like these positions are not that fun for black. Like, you're just stuck with this bishop on c8. Like, yeah, you can trade it off. Like, you have b6, a5, bishop, a6 ideas, but in general, you're just kind of in a passive position. You're lacking some space. It's solid, like, but it doesn't feel like a very fun position to play, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, even though it, objectively it's it's probably fine, like the like you know twenty eight hundreds play this move right, so it's got to be okay. But I I don't know if you would have fun playing the position. Lines that are more fun include let's say c five, um, and this is the way that uh, Hikaru was playing this one for many years. Um, the idea here is that we're just trying to challenge white in the center. You want to get your knight to c six, and maybe even leave your opponent with an isolated queen pawn if allowed. So. In this line, generally, it's considered that white's only chance to fight for the advantage is with dc. And the point that white tries is they go for queen c2, sometimes they castle queen side, or sometimes they castle king side, and they try to put pressure on the d-pawn. And basically, they're playing against the light squared bishop here. Right, so white is not really going to take on d5 and let you open up the bishop. They're just going to force you to figure it out. And while you're playing like b6, bishop, b7, or this kind of thing, white is getting like a3, b4 in, or they're getting uh, the pressure on the d file. And so that's how white kind of tries to pose um, some problems in this position. So this, I would say, is maybe the sharpest approach to the bishop f4, queen's gambit decline. So if you want to like study some theory and go for like the theoretical stuff that's also very sharp. So it's not like quiet and passive, it's sharp and dynamic, right? Um, then this is kind of the line. And yeah, black continues like knight c6 here, a3, queen a5, typically. Um, stopping b4 because the rook on a1 is hanging and uh, preparing sometimes like rook e8, e5 ideas. Um, for this variation, I would definitely suggest checking out Hikaru's games because he, he was like, I think, he was playing this like almost every single game. Other guys played it too, like maybe Magnus and, and Vichy and even Fabi, but um, Hikaru was playing this one in, in tons and tons of games. Um, so yeah. Um, other options here. Oh, right. And the last option, the one that I, I would actually recommend, because I think it's just the most like simple and practical. I think a6 is reasonable. I think c5 is, is interesting as well. Um, B6 to me seems like the, the solid move. If you don't want to learn a lot of theory, if you just want like a normal setup here with black and just like play a regular Queen's Gambit declined, to me, I don't I don't really see any huge drawbacks with B6 here. There's a couple different ways that the, the game can go. Um, if white takes on D5, I think a lot of times black tries to take with pieces. So this is kind of one idea of the B6 line that you always keep this diagonal open you do not want to go ed5, um, although there are different ways to play it. There are lots of players who play that structure as well. 
but this is just one idea. And then you try to play for c5 and you equalize in the center this way. Um, we're also threatening bishop b4 check in this position. So this one is not super fun for white because like if they could just go bishop d3 in castle, that would be uh, that would be nice. They can have like the c file as well. But the issue is that we're immediately threatening this bishop b4 check. So white kind of has to spend a tempo on a3 or has to commit to moving the king. And that gives us time for like c5 and stuff. And don't even think about bishop takes c7. From white's point of view, it's so risky to take this kind of pawn because you're already down in development. Black is castled, you're not. And then, yeah, you're just uh, giving up more tempi um, and yeah, likely to just get, get killed here. So definitely do not take this pawn on c7 in most cases. Um, so that's one way white can play it. You can also go ed5 here. And this is uh, totally reasonable as well. Here we would be playing for kind of like c5, bishop b7, knight d7. This would be like a typical um, typical setup here for black. Uh, white doesn't always take on d5 though. This is just something that some players do. Most players are going to go like bishop d3 here or like a3 or rook c1. And then black's plan is pretty simple. Um, you can take on c4 and go bishop b7. I think there is some theory with bishop a6. I believe this is a move as well. To me, it kind of falls into one of those um, passive lines where not so sure black is going to be having fun like with your knight on a6. Um, but I would suggest just like bishop b7, knight d7, playing for c5, maybe a6 somewhere, rook c8, just like classic, classic queen's gambit declined. I mean, this plan has existed since the dawn of time, <laughs> essentially. And so I think it's like never going to be uh, that bad for black. So if you don't want to learn a lot of theory, you just want something like super solid that you can play in like any time control and just feel comfortable with like, you know, your typical structure. To me, b6 feels uh, quite reasonable. The other options are solid too, maybe a little bit more theory. A a6 is kind of a cheeky move as well that might throw some opponents off guard. Um, but uh, okay, if a6, you should also be kind of ready for what you're going to do against c5. This would be a move to, to think about as well. Um, yeah, we have a link there in the chat for new players that has um, my friend David's advice for players that are on the beginner side of things. So hopefully that helps. Okay, let's go to the next question, which comes from uh, Brandon. Shout out to Brandon, thanks for the question. What are the main strengths and weaknesses of the Chebanenko Slav versus the classical Slav or other variations? Okay. Yeah, so I'm not like a huge Slav expert, but I, I have been a D4 player for quite some time. So I faced the Slav and all these different lines. Um, let's first go into what these actually are. So the key position where like, Black has a lot of choices is this one, or white develops both knights, black goes knight of six. And here black has, I guess, yeah, three main options. D takes C4, that's the classical Slav. E6, that's the semi-Slav. Uh, A6 is the Chebanenko Slav, AKA the chameleon, because it's like um, very flexible. Okay, and a fourth op option, uh, G6, which is also um, uh, reasonable, but I think this one is considered better when white is committed to um, E3. Uh, don't quote me on that, though, um, even though this is going on YouTube. OK, shout out to YouTube. Um, <laughs> so DC4, this is the classical Slav. Let's just say this one has been considered the solid main line for many, many years. As far as I'm aware, it's still holding up uh, perfectly fine for black. And so a lot of players from white's point of view, they're not really going to be fighting for an advantage here just to get some kind of uh, solid position maybe small space advantage, but if black is um, careful, they, they should equalize. Um, there's like the Geller Gambit as well with E4, which is kind of interesting, like a sharp approach from white, but objectively black uh, is supposedly holding their own in these lines. That said, guys, I mean, typical disclaimer about the openings. It's all about what positions you feel comfortable in. So if you like this big center with white and you like attacking, play this position. It's not going to be like that easy for black, right? You know, you're not playing against an engine, you're playing against a uh, human opponent who has to kind of deal with your initiative. So if this is what you like, absolutely you can go for it. Um, so yeah, the classical Slav, let's say a4, bishop f5, lots of theory here, but generally black is considered um, 
to have a pretty solid game. The bishop gets outside the pawn chain, all the pieces find good squares, and eventually when black uh, organizes some kind of pawn break like c5 or e5, they, they should equalize. Okay, then you have the semi-slav, um, which is definitely not as direct as like the classical slav. Here black accepts a bad bishop for quite some time, with the eventual plan of like taking, going b5, bishop b7, and bringing the bishop out to life. And this one can actually be extremely sharp, uh, depending on what white plays. Um, I would say it's maybe, yeah, one of the more theoretical openings in chess, one of the sharper ones. Um, you know, both sides have like a million different ideas. <laughs> it's just a huge, huge battleground. Like, I think it's been a battleground for many years, and I think it will be continue to be a battleground. Like, it's just a uh, very solid opening for black. Like, theoretically, I mean, White doesn't have, um, there's obviously no refutation or, or anything like that, but White does have like a million different tries, right? So it's just like total uh, total slugfest in this opening. Um, and then lastly, we have the Chameleon Slav, the Chebanenko, which starts with a6. And so the point of this one is just to be flexible. So why does Black need to be flexible? Because you can't go Bishop f5 here. You can't develop the Bishop when White still has takes, takes, Queen b3, right? That's the issue for Black. And whatever black does, there has to be some concession here, right? Like the point of dc4 is to give black enough time to get the bishop out to um, f5, right? Because we're taking away this square. And by the time white is winning back the c4 pawn, the bishop is already coming out and black can claim a solid position. So whatever black does here, it's some kind of concession to get the bishop out. Um, e6, of course, blocks the bishop in uh, for the near future. So a6 is kind of just trying to get the best of all worlds. It supports black because now when you take on c4 and you play b5, like both c6 and a6 are very useful moves for you there. So you're definitely going to be holding on to the pawn and you are threatening to take the pawn in, in many positions. Um, and at the same time, you're also kind of planning a, a b5 push, which can be a useful idea for you um, in, in the future. Um, so this is a really interesting opening. I would say that it's not easy to play. Um, like to me, I think a lot of the ideas are not obvious uh, for black because sometimes you have to um, uh, deal with this kind of structure where white gains a lot of space and then you have to decide whether you want to block your bishop in or risk having your bishop stuck on the king side when white actually goes queen b3 and goes after your queen side, right? So. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what to say here. I think it's a very solid line. Like, of course, it holds up theoretically, but I probably wouldn't be recommending it to students because I think it's quite subtle. So if you've never played like the Slav before, like, I, I don't think this would be a good, like, first opening for someone. Maybe, I don't know. I, I think I would, I would suggest DC4. I think that's just like much more straightforward for black. Then once you get comfortable with this, those positions, you kind of understand a little bit, maybe switching to, um, to A6 here. Uh, if you want to try it out. Oh, hey, we have uh, Brandon in the chat. Um, have I found as white that the rook is misplaced on a7? Well, yeah, that's the thing. It's like sometimes you got to go like rook a7 in that position, which is just maybe it's fine, but it's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like you need a certain kind of um, temperament. So if you're looking for solid over sharper theoretical lines, um, my feeling is you're probably good with the classical. Um, like a6 is very solid, but definitely not that obvious. But don't let me discourage you because like it is a really interesting opening and there are lots of lots of very strong players that did really well with it. So like if it kind of appeals to you because it would take white out of their comfort zone, um, I think, I mean, it's definitely worth worth at least looking into it, like at least trying it out. Um, many players, I mean, you know, from White's point of view, like as a D4 player, I definitely focused more on this one and the semi-slot, right? So against me, this would have been a choice that would kind of take me out of my own comfort zone, right? So it could, um, it could be useful for you. There's also a very natural idea to just play B5 next move, right? So it can be pretty simple. Like if White just goes E3 here, you go B5, B3, um, these positions are not not too difficult for black. E6, knight D7, and so on. Oh, you got a Kalavik uh, repertoire. Cool, cool, cool. 
Um, why did I recommend the Slav, but not the Queen's Gambit decline? I, I don't know. I think um, for me, I've always felt like the Slav is a simpler opening to play for uh, beginners uh, because it's easier for black to solve the problem of the light squared bishop. That's kind of what it's about. Like you take on c4, the bishop comes out to f5, and your job is done. Or if white plays like e3 here, which is very popular, you go bishop f5, or you go bishop g4, and your job is done. <laughs> but in the queen's gambit declined, you know, you really have to figure out how you're going to get the bishop out, and it's it's not that simple. Yeah, so J-Black says they like the Chebanenko because like the common moves when people aren't familiar with the line are pretty bad, right? So that is one of the advantages of playing a6 here is that you are kind of just threatening to take on c4 and hold on to the pawn. Um, so if white makes some random move like bishop f4, I'm pretty sure black can just get away with taking and going b5 and, and you get a very good version of, uh, you know, basically you're, you're almost have like a clean extra pawn here. So it is uh, definitely an advantage of, of this system over others. Um, doesn't the Slav get sharp once the pawn breaks come in? Well, I think we can just say that about any opening. <laughs> I think pretty much any opening has sharp variations in it. Um, so it's more about just like the overall uh, character of, of the lines that you get. Like if you just pluck a random variation in the Sicilian and a random variation in the Slav, I think it's likely that the Sicilian is going to be sharper, you know? <laughs> so. Um, but yeah, all openings, you know, can explode uh, when it comes to the middle game. And there are many lines in the slot that are very, very sharp. So yeah, I think we can say that about pretty much any opening. Um, okay, Brandon, hope that helps. Uh, next question comes from Joe B. Uh, Joe B is asking, what's the best way for... Whoops. Oops. <laughs> what's the best way... To prevent black from castling long in Rui Lopez exchange variation. Uh, especially when they play bishop g4, it means you castle as fast as possible while pinning the knight and uh, each trees mount with h5, right? If castling cannot be prevented, which I suspect so in many of the lines, not including bishop g4, how can white transition into the endgame? Yeah, interesting question. I had to look this one up because I, I didn't really know the answer offhand. Um, I've played e4, e5 from Black's point of view, so I've had to deal with the um, with the Rui Lopez exchange quite a bit. So I've mainly seen these positions from from Black's perspective, and almost every line that I've um, tried or learned, Black is castling queenside. <laughs> so off the top of my head, I couldn't think of a line where Black doesn't get to castle queenside if they want to. Black doesn't always have to, but if they want to, it seems like. Um, that's hard to prevent. Like I, uh, I think castles is the main move here. I used to play f6 as black. I think um, queen f6 is also a reasonable move. Um, there's a question about bishop g4, which we'll get into. Where yeah, in all these lines, black is usually just going uh, queen side because the king is safe there. You get the rook on the nice open d file. Then yeah, in general with the two bishops, I you know I think black's chances in in the structure are are perfectly fine. Um, I, I played f6 for quite some time and. This was always very, very solid. Like white would go d4, we take. Knight takes d4, black goes c5, we go into the end game. And um, after takes, takes bishop d7, black castles queenside. White can definitely put some pressure in this kind of end game, and a lot of players do this. But I think if you know a couple of ideas as black and you're kind of familiar with it, generally you're not too afraid of, of this kind of end game. Um, okay. But question is how to deal with bishop g4. So yeah, I, I took a look at this one. There's a line here, h3, h5, uh, where I think it's pretty much losing for white if, if they take um, right away. So generally white will just play like d3 here, queen f6, knight d2, and just try to hold on to um, this knight on f3 and not really take because this fishing pole idea is almost always just very dangerous. Black is always like at least okay, I think. Um, so this is the way that white usually uh, deals with this one. And um, if I remember correctly, black's main move here is to just castle. Oh no, excuse me, not castle, knight e7. They can castle as well, but I think knight e7 is the main move. And this line uh, can get pretty annoying. I remember looking at it from black's point of view because I wanted to kind of maybe try something sharp. And it does feel like Black can get some real annoying attacking play against our king. 
Um, but if we want an end game, I think after uh, knight c4, it seems like black is more or less um, just taking on f3 here and going for the end game. So this would be kind of the move order to get into uh, the end game. Um, the point, uh, I believe, just based on you know the games in the database, is that if black was to play knight to g6 here, then white does take. Um, because now after takes, takes, we have bishop to g5. Uh, so there's no queen g6 here, where the queen gets to the h file, which would be very scary. And so here the attack is actually, seems like it's not working for black. According to the database, white has won like every game here. I'll just quickly check like the uh, the engine eval just to confirm that black has nothing. And yeah, white is white is just winning here. So Goomba, to answer your question, why bother h3 if you don't plan to take? Because if, if black messes around too much, uh, you will take one day and, and hold on to the piece. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> so, so black has to follow up very precisely. So after knight c4, um, with this uh, possible threat of takes, takes, bishop g5. But here black just doesn't have another move because we're also um, threatening to take on e5 here. So if black can't go knight g6, you're threatening the pawn. They're pretty much forced to take on f3, and then we take with the queen and invite black into um, this end game. So this is as far as I remember, and uh, I mean, I, I just checked. I, I believe this is the main line. Um, for for this position. And so when I was looking at this one from Black's point of view, I wasn't super thrilled to go into this because I was like, well, I was trying to get like an attack. I don't wanna like now play the end game. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly the point uh, of the line for me. So I, I never really wanted to look into this one too much, but it is an end game and play, a lot of strong players have played this one. Anand, Caruana, Sergisian, Robson, Postney, like a bunch of GMs have gone into this position. So clearly it's solid for Black. But it's also kind of what white wants when we're playing the Rui Lopez exchange. Like the question was asking, um, how can white transition into the end game? And yeah, I think this is a fair question because this is usually usually the idea when we're playing the Rui exchange is that we want to play long term against the double pawns. And in the end game is where the structure starts to kind of matter a little bit more, um, where white just has a slightly healthier structure. And uh, especially if white's pawns weren't doubled, of course, those positions, white has kind of a long term structural advantage. Here with GF3, it's not like a perfect world for white, um, but I do think that white's structure here still is slightly better. So I kind of looked into it a little bit. Uh, I think black usually plays knight g6 here, and a typical plan is to go rook d1 in this position. Kind of a weird move, but the point is to transfer the king over to the center, where it kind of defends all the pawns nicely. Knight f4 is always meant with bishop takes f4. And then the rook can uh, use the g file and put some pressure that way, maybe looking for some rook g5. Black doesn't really want to go f6 here. Um, and yeah, I think if if you're playing the Rui exchange, then chances are you are looking for some kind of like uh, interesting endgame to get into to put some pressure on the opponent. So this, I think, is is the way to, to go. And it um, seems like a lot of strong players enter this endgame from white as well. Looks like Gusenov has a number of games from, from this position. So he's pretty good. Uh, Nidich as well, apparently beat Caruana once here, so that's, uh, yeah. Nidich is another guy, I think he's played the exchange a little bit. Not sure. Um, so, yeah, hope that uh, makes sense for you, Joe. Okay, and next we have a question from uh, Laurent. And uh, yeah, we got the final two questions from Laurent and, and Jimmy here, who both submitted basically last night. We put up the last call, <laughs> which is totally fine. Okay, Laurent says, hi, I hope I'm not too late. My question is, do you think going uh, queenside castling is a viable attempt as white? A queen's gambit declined exchange when black has played h6. Okay, then he gives a possible line. And uh, alternatively, do you think it makes a difference? Black goes like bishop e6 first. Okay, let's let's put it on the board. We'll take a look. Um, yeah, I, I think I understand the question that Laurent is um, asking here. Let's put his sample line on the board. Knight c3, knight f6. 
takes, takes bishop g5. So this is the queen's gambit declined exchange variation. Bishop e7, e3, black throws in h6, bishop h4, castles, bishop d3, c6, uh, knight f3. Then Laurent says, not the most flexible, but I may get the position from a different move order with an early knight f3, right? Uh, and then knight d7, queen c2, rook e8, and the queen side castling. And then he says, alternatively, do you think it makes a difference if black goes bishop e6 first, um, and then then knight d7 and if white castles here yeah so really interesting question and uh, i appreciate that laurent is like asking rather than just like you know feeding the position to an engine and, and seeing what it thinks because i don't think the engine is always like super super useful uh kind of this early on in the opening when choosing a direction hey we got a raid from art vega welcome welcome thanks so much uh maybe we could get a shout out for art vega in uh, the chat from one of our mods. Um, welcome readers, we are in the middle of an opening lab, uh, which is where a monthly show where I answer opening questions from some of our patron subscribers. Yeah, thanks Dor. So um, we are just discussing a question here on the Queen's Gambit declined. And the question is, um, uh, should white castle queenside? Is that a viable? Is that a viable plan? Yeah. Welcome, welcome. Um, so, right. I think in general, castling queenside in uh, these kinds of positions and castling queenside in general, when you do it in chess, um, leads to a much sharper and much more dynamic game. So, in my experience. Uh, just to answer the question, like, yeah, usually it's a viable attempt in many of these positions. Um, whether black has to play h6 or not first to me is totally unclear. I'm not sure it makes a huge difference, actually. I think the question Laurent is asking, like, is it better if black has played h6? Because this, again, gives white a hook. We kind of talked about this with um, the Chevenne again when we looked at that earlier, where this h6 move actually can make white's attack easier. Um, with rook g1 and, and g4, g5, and opening up the, the g file. So while this move can be helpful earlier in the middle game here with opposite size castling, can actually be kind of detrimental for black. Um, so that's, that's the question. And yeah, I think this is honestly just really tough one um, to answer. I'll show some ideas here. So one idea that black often relies on in these positions um, is this move knight e4. And this is one that I would be uh, almost like expecting actually from black whenever they set up with rook to e8 here against this bishop. A lot of times the idea is to go knight e4 and kind of try to exchange pieces. And so this position like, yeah, I'm not totally sure um, what's happening here, but in general, I think black is gonna be like pretty solid with this e4 square. And yeah, then one day the counterplay will come, b5, b4, and so on. So this would be one idea to kind of watch out for. Um, the other move order Laurent asked about was bishop e6, and then knight d7, and then castles here. So here black doesn't really have the same knight e4 idea because the e-file is, uh, is blocked. Um, but with the bishop outside on e6, then rook c8 and, and c5 is... Uh, I think typically giving black um, pretty dangerous uh, play. I think b5 is also possible here, but with the bishop already out from c8, rook c8, c5 just looks, it, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes white is faster here, but generally this, this gives black pretty dangerous counterplay that white has to watch out for. Um, so my like evaluation of this plan is that it's just very risky. It's playable. Uh, but it's very risky and, uh, you know, I would generally prefer kind of like quiet lines where you castle kingside, you play your minority attack like a3, b4, and just kind of slowly try to build the uh, advantage. Here I think castling queenside, definitely risky. Um, that said, I looked up two games I had where I kind of utilized this queenside um, castling idea and... My feeling, Laurent, I don't know if this is correct. This is just what I've gained 
from my own games is that a lot of times you, um, well, you want to get G4 in <laughs> before you castle. So you want to kind of build the attack and then castle once your attack is already um, going. I don't know if you can get it necessarily in this uh, variation, but I had some games I'll just show you maybe will would be useful as like um, a reference point. And we can kind of compare. Um, let's say knight f3, d5. So this was one game I had back in 2016. Maybe bishop f4, castles. I played a3 here, this is that cheeky move I was telling you guys about. Um, my opponent played c6, e3, knight d7. So this, of course, is not an exchange variation, and deliberately, um, I don't take here for uh, some time. So queen c2, b6. Now I took as white. Now that black has played b6 and is intending to put the bishop on this diagonal, now it makes sense to kind of fix the structure. Um, e takes d5, bishop d3, bishop b7 was played. And now in this position, I played g4. So I definitely don't think this is necessarily the best move, far from it. Um, but I do think it was like a really interesting moment to try this idea. And I do feel it's important to play this move before uh, castling. I mean, you could castle first, but then it kind of like gives away your intentions. When you play g4, now you're like threatening to advance g5 and get your attack going. And so it's kind of like faster and who knows, maybe you don't even need to spend a, a tempo on castling, right? If you can play g4, g5, h4, like get your attack going, your opponent has to start reacting to you. They don't have time to create the queenside counterplay. Then at the right time, you castle queenside and get your second rook into the attack. So that's kind of always just been like my intuition on how to play these um, positions. So here on g4, okay, it's not really a pawn sack because of knight g4, of course we're hitting h7, but even if h7 um, was not our target, just the idea of getting the open G file, this is always compensation. So even if we don't win the pawn back, we just castle, we double on the G file, that's always really nice play um, for white. Um, yeah, so in the game, black played G6, which I think is probably uh, a really bad move. Um, <clears throat> Question, if black starts uh, a pawn storm on the queen side, would I consider king e2, king f1? Yeah, absolutely. That's kind of the other point here is um, maybe there are positions where the king will be safer on e2. Like if black starts going crazy and flinging all the pawns, maybe we don't need to put our king on c1. It might be safer on e2. So I would say that's rare, but it can happen. Maybe not in like this structure, but like in different positions. For sure, you can like sometimes have a safe king on f1, or you go king f, king e2, rook a g1. There's just nothing black can do to you. The e file uh, is closed. Yeah, I'll show you guys the game. So the reason g6 is bad is because it um, essentially just gives white another uh, a larger hook for the attack. Now, when we go h4, h5, we're opening up the h file. I think I just immediately played h4 here. Yeah, right. So I don't, I don't care about this. Um, G pawn. If black takes, the follow-up would be h5. And now we're threatening to take three times. One, <laughs> two, and then with the queen, with checkmate. So this is just extremely dangerous attack, and it's because black played g6 that white is able to now open the h-file and open up all these lines. Um, so... Yeah, black can try like something like f5 here, I was thinking, but then my idea would be to like take, take, and like now I castle. I think this is what I was thinking during the game. Now that we've like made some huge progress, now you castle, now you go rook dg1, and it's like already um, like huge, huge threats in the position. Yeah, so this is the problem is that g6, it's like a very, very temporary fix. Um, and white just continues full steam ahead. And I think this works because, okay, bishop on b7 is not, not so good here. So white's kind of exploiting this. So, okay, the game I think was well played. Um, c5 was played. I went h5. Black goes knight e4. Now black starts playing, I think, well, but white's attack was still really dangerous. So we went hg, hg, castles. Black took on d4. I took with the knight. 
um, Rook C8 was played. And then I think I found a nice idea here because now black has like some counterplay I decided to take with the bishop uh, and go f3 um, with uh, this idea. So queen is opened up to the h2 square. And this is just a game you play when you're attacking. Like how do you get the queen to the h file in the least number of moves? Well, f3. Um, and so that was just kind of more or less decisive. Black tried this one. Bishop takes a3. King b1. Yeah, very Sicilian, right? Like, but the the ideas do transfer over. Like, whenever we have opposite sides castling, it's uh yeah, these ideas can definitely transfer. Queen f6 was played, queen h2, uh, rook c8, and um yeah, I was really happy with my move here. Actually, this move ended the game. Knight e6. I thought it was pretty, I thought it was pretty clever. So the point is, like, if we go immediate queen h7 check, king f8, knight e6, there's, um, well, there's queen takes for one. There's also, like, uh, king can move over. Um, but if we start with knight e6, we're threatening mate because we're taking the escape square. And then if black takes, first of all, with the queen, then there's queen h8 mate, right? And with if black takes with the pawn, then we have this one and bishop h6. And the point is that the knight on d7... Uh, is hanging, so we have queen takes d7 at the end. So I thought it was kind of a nice, I thought it was a cute idea. Um, and otherwise, black has no move, no checks, and we're threatening maiden one. So this was, he resigned here, this was just, just game over. Um, so yeah, it feels like bishop f4 is um, a better spot. No, I totally agree. With the bishop on f4, you don't have to worry about knight e4 ideas uh, as white compared to the bishop on h4. And I think your, your bishop is also just like more useful on this diagonal and puts pressure on h6. So whenever black has like h6 on the board, then your bishop is like supporting g5. You have like some sacrifice ideas. You're also not blocking your h pawn. So that could be one takeaway. I don't know, like depending on when, when black goes h6, it could make sense to drop back to bishop f4. And this could be a better way to try to get your, your queenside castling plan. Because I, I do think the bishop would be better placed here. The drawback, of course, is you always have to deal with knight h5 ideas. So that's that's kind of the, the main thing there. And then the question is, well, if you're going to go back to f4, why not just put your bishop on f4 in the first place? Why put it on g5 at all? Because uh, it's not necessary that we do want to provoke h6, I think. h6 can be... Can be useful sometimes. Um, so actually, just to quickly wrap up on on this game, instead of g6, what Black should have done was play the immediate c5 and just like pre-move knight e4. Essentially, just just putting the knight on e4 as quickly as possible to kind of plug the diagonal and get counterplay. And then the position is very unclear. It's not like White has a huge advantage or anything. Um, White has some ideas like gaining space, like maybe h4 or g5, um, but but Black would would be able to fight for some counterplay, even with like a pawn sack, like knight e4. If White takes a bunch of times, okay, we won the pawn, but position kind of opens up, and and Black can get some very nasty counterplay very quickly. So this is not exactly the kind of position White is looking for when going like g4 h4. So. I think it's kind of instructive also how black should have responded, like just immediate c5, knight e4, and then white should um, be careful not to let the position get too out of control. Yeah, I mean, chess is a balanced game. It's not surprising that black is okay in the queen's gambit decline. Hopefully that's not like breaking news for, for anyone, that black objectively is pretty solid <laughs> in the queen's gambit <laughs> decline. Hey, pass pawn with the sub. 15 months, nice. Okay. Um, oh, and then actually I had a second game. I just want to share because I, I think it's interesting because the second game I played several months later. So this game I won brilliantly. It was really nice. Then I had a second game kind of similar. Um, I think this was actually an I Am Norm tournament. Might have been. Oh, yeah. Actually, this game was played in the in my 
final I Am Norm tournament, the one where I got uh, my final I Am Norm. And I was actually crushing the tournament leading up to this point. Um, and this came from Semislav Border, where Black played Bishop e7. So not really the most challenging from White's point of view. h6. Oh, by the way, notice Laurent. I played Bishop f4 in this position, so that's kind of funny. Not for my reasoning was back then, but interesting. b6, Bishop d3. Bishop b7, I took on d5. E takes d5. And again, I played g4 here. Here, I think it, it is... It is a decent idea. So here, in the last position, the pawn was on h7. Here, the pawn's on h6. Basically, same position. Um, and now if takes... Again, we're going rook to g1. We're going h3, castles. I think white would get really decent play. Um, so this game, my opponent played better. He immediately goes c5. I went h4. Knight c6. Uh, g5. Now black goes for knight b4, which... Certainly is uh, principled, but I think was not right. Queen e2, takes, takes. Because black gets the light squared bishop, but the bishop is very, very passive. Um, knight h5. And yeah, so here uh, I ended up kind of overthinking things, and I played this move, bishop e5. After which black played f6, which I think was good. Takes, bishop takes f6. Basically, game got very complicated, but more or less black was fine. Black was able to get some counterplay and eventually ended up winning, um, winning the game. So it was quite, quite an unpleasant experience for me. So what should I have done? Well, I should have just simply taken the pawn on h6. And I kind of had that, like, I did that typical thing players do sometimes when you have, like, nice attacking position. It was like, I was thinking, okay, gh6, g6, and then I was like... Mm, how am I going to break through here? You know, like I wasn't sure. Maybe he takes here first um, and then goes G6. And I'm like, Ugh, my structure is like super ugly. So like I wasn't sure. And I just wanted like the best of all worlds. I like I want Bishop E5. I don't want to let him take on F4. I want to take here cleanly. And then I, I wasn't able to get anything actually after F6. So that was my mistake. Um, yeah, indeed. After takes, takes, takes here. I mean, lots of moves. H5, F5, castling, followed by rook G1. White's attack is really strong. Yeah. I mean, the structure doesn't matter here. The knight comes to E5 or G5. It's just fantastic position. Black slide square bishop still really bad. Um, he can try like bishop C8 or something here, but... Uh, yeah, I still like White's chances. Even this one, even just like taking, taking. Well, White's like up two pawns now. So. Um, but yeah, maybe this one right away. Maybe h5. Maybe just rook g1. Actually, simplest. Or maybe just castles bishop c8 rook g1, and then there's no bishop f5. Um, and yeah, threatening this one. So uh, that was kind of my bad. But it shows you, you know, these attacking positions are not not easy to play. So. Um, hopefully, hopefully that's, uh, interesting for you guys. I'm not sure. Not sure. Yeah. So in general, castle and queen side is playable, but it's, it's sharp. It's always sharp. Yeah. And Bishop may be better on F4 for these types of positions. <laughs> But it happens a lot. Um, you know, the other thing, actually, I should mention that some players do, Laurent, they take on f6. And, uh, and then they just castle. Or they go like g4, h4. This is also worth investigating. Because you get g4, h4, g5 very quickly. And then same idea, castles, bishop, d3, and, and black is missing, you know, key defender, right? So this is actually not easy for black to deal with. I think I've seen Magnus play this, this kind of way as well. So this could also be quite interesting. Um, okay, we had uh, one last question. I think this one we can actually get through pretty quick. It, I know it's a long question, but I think it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> question from Jimmy. Wow, the thing doesn't even fit. Oh, 
Okay, there we go. Uh, question from Jimmy. Um, recently in the Discord, there was a conversation about the Aljohin's defense. Uh, having never looked at it, I decided to spend some time with it this month to learn the basic ideas of the opening. I was fairly surprised to see it held in fairly respectable regard, if not a main weapon. Um, I was wondering why, in your eyes, it is considered better than things like the Scandinavian, both Knight of Six and the Queen Takes lines. I assume some of the respect it gets is on account of who has played it, uh, but I suspect there is something that sets it apart from other offbeat openings that strong players like. But I'm not sure I understand what it is. Yeah, interesting question. I, I definitely don't have the concrete answer for you. Um, I would say, like, I'm I'm not even sure that it is held in higher regard than the Scandi. I, I think it kind of depends on, on who you ask. Like, I haven't heard anything um, in, like, the title player group, you know, with the meetings that we attend. Um, <laughs> I think, as far as I'm aware, they're considered to be pretty level in terms of, like, they're both not you know, top tier openings for black, right? When it comes to the highest levels, I think E4, E5 is like, you know, just hands down the most solid. Pretty much everyone plays this one. And then you have um, uh, the Nidorf, which is also extremely uh, solid and the Sveshnikov, which theoretically like does very well. Um, so these are like your kind of like top tier openings. I think the Karo is like in pretty good standing in general. And then you have like, let's say your second tier openings that are like totally playable for like 99.9% .9 of the chess playing population. So like Perk, Alakine, Scandi. But from like the professional's point of view, these openings, even if they're like slightly less solid than E4, E5, well, that's already enough of a reason not to play them, right? So if E4, E5 is the most solid thing, then they're going to play E4, E5. If E4, C5 is the most solid thing, you know, they're going to play E4, C5. Um, so, yeah, when it comes to, like, the highest levels, they're just trying to equalize with black as comfortably as possible. They don't want to have, like, some, like, weird position that, you know, they have to know very well to hold. So they generally look for like the most solid lines, but that doesn't mean that these are bad openings for, for everyone else. And lots of people do perfectly fine with the Scandi and, and the Alakine. So I don't know which of these openings is held in, in higher regard. I mean, it's really hard to say. Um, I, I do know quite a few GMs that do like the approach of um, getting white to advance and, you know, playing against uh, White's pawn advances, especially if white goes for these lines with like c4. That could be one reason. I'm just like pure spec speculating here. Like in the in the Scandi, you don't quite get white to like kind of commit and overextend as much as you can in the Alakine. So we could say that maybe the Scandi is slightly easier for, for white to play. I'm not sure if that's actually true. I'm sure there are lots of players who struggle against it. Um, but that could be one reason why a lot of players like the Alakine, because it does kind of you know, if Y wants to like punish it or crush it, they have to kind of take on some risk uh, themselves. But uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? Mm. Taimanov is still being played, but yeah, I think the queen f3, bishop e3 line is pretty, pretty dangerous. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. I mean, you don't really see either the Scandi or the Alakine at the top level outside of like um, Blitz and Rapid Chess. Like Magnus will play the Scandinavian every once in a while and um, I'm sure there are GMs like playing the Alakine, but um, I mean, I don't know. As far as what happens at the top level, I don't think should affect our decisions that much. Like, even at I am level, like if someone plays this against me, I'm not just gonna like crush them. <laughs> like maybe I'll get a small advantage, but it'll still be like a very fighting game. Driven says they hate um, playing against this as white because they can never hold the center. My suggestion guys, by the way, would be not to play C4, go Knight F3, Bishop E2, and, um, and Castle. 
and then go c4, knight c3 only once you're castled and developed. See, I think that's the thing is that in the Alicon, maybe white is like more likely to overextend. Um, but that said, I think there are strategic traps in the uh, in the Scandi as well. So, um, yeah, hard to say one is necessarily better than the other. They're both tricky. Um, for recreational players, I want to prove isn't it better just to get good at openings that hold all through the ranks. No, because you can always switch to something else. So it's not like if you play the Alakine and you get to like 2,500, then all of a sudden, you know, you switch to E4, E5 and like you don't know how to play chess anymore. Like you can always switch your openings later. So it's um, it's not a big deal. Now, again, like I don't really recommend this stuff for black. I think like for me, they're just more fun openings for black, but it, they have their upsides. Um, yeah, if DE were just generally taking with the knight pretty much everywhere. That's what I like about this line is kind of simple. You go knight f3 and then you just always take on e5 with the knight. Yeah, I would say you only got to worry about openings if, if they become a problem. If you're losing like every game in the opening, then yeah, you got to work on your openings a little bit. If generally your games are okay and you know you're like blundering stuff and like messing it up in the middle game and end game, well that that's what you gotta work on. <laughs> so I would say for the most part, we put too much emphasis on opening. Because it feels like the the one thing we can kind of control before the game and really prep and it makes so much sense. If I could just memorize all the openings, I'll know everything and I'll play perfect every time. But look, you're not gonna memorize all the openings. That's not gonna happen. It's not going to, you're not, you're always going to get something new. <laughs> always going to get something new over the board. And it's, it's always just going to be about how you handle the middle game, how you handle the strategy and the tactics in the middle game. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think any opening that grandmasters play regularly is fine, <laughs> right? Like, don't worry about the top guy. Let's make that the, the threshold. If if there's some grandmasters that are playing the opening regularly, let's just assume it's completely fine. And, and so that includes Scandi, that includes Alakine, that doesn't include Bond Cloud because there are no GMs that play that regularly in tournament games. I don't think it includes Stafford yet, but there hasn't been enough OTB chess, so maybe that'll change. <laughs> We might see some GMs playing it again and again. King's Gambit, absolutely real opening. We've seen lots of GMs play that one, yeah, over the years. And they score fine with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just know the ideas. Uh, is there a GM that plays 1v6? I, I think there are. Yeah, not many though. Not very few. Very, very few. But there probably are some. Um, all right, guys, that's it for me. That's it for the opening lap. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, but not in not in serious games, not in serious games. Yeah, but thanks to everyone who submitted. Once again, this is a monthly show we do for our Patreon subscribers that can submit questions to get answered on the show. Thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon. You guys are very much appreciated. Obviously, Twitch subs are appreciated as well.